Thanks, Ivan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we have the slides. Yeah, we do have the slides. All right. Um, it's it's really impressive, honestly. It's uh, so. Let me tell you this before we start. If you ever want to change job and you uh, prepare your CV, what you should put there is, I attend the first talk of the second day of a conference. That's an achievement. So congratulate yourself for being here, such, uh, such crowd. I'm, I'm super uh, excited that you guys all made it here. Um, as Ivan said, my name is Milen Jankov. I work for Exonic. Exonic is a company that deals with uh, software that helps Java developers and all JVM language developers actually uh, help uh, deal with things like domain-driven design, event sourcing, and secure S. Uh, and um, my role is a developer advocate, so I, I kind of bridge the gap between our technologists who are building the software and people like you who are using software for to build actually meaningful things in this world. Um, so. In those conversations uh, with, with, with different people, we always end up talking about events. Event driven, event this, event that. And, and, and one thing I came to realize is many different people have, they use the same word and they put a different meaning behind it. So I thought it's about time to kind of do a talk about what, what that actually means. And so let's, let's, let's understand the, let's dive deeper into the, these event-related concepts and, and methodolo methodologies and see, um, and see if we can establish some deeper understanding than just talking about events. So, hope you don't mind joining me today for a little journey through the event land. And as with any journey, we'll start at the door. Now, there is a door that you can see on the screen. And there's two things you know about that door. It has an ID, it's 28, and it's yellow. Wait, it's red. When did it become red? Now, think about that for a second. The state of that door just changed. But if you are to ask yourself now the question is, why it is red, he said yellow, when did it become red? Well, you observe it, but maybe you didn't notice it. Or who is responsible for the door becoming red? Or what was the color before, if you're a minute late? You can't answer these questions by just knowing that the door ID is 28 and it's red. Right? If you, in other words, if you, the only thing you know about an object is its current state as of now, there is no way for you to do any reasoning about the past state of the object. And that may or may not be interesting for the type of application that you build. But if instead of storing state, you were to store changes, like Joe painted door 28 red yesterday, if you store changes like this, there's quite a lot you can tell from that change. You can say, you can tell why it is red. Well, it was painted. You can tell when it became red. It was yesterday. Uh, and Joe's obviously the one to blame if something goes wrong. You still can't tell where, what was the color before. But then, if you are storing this information as changes, not states, you probably have some changes that you have stored in the past. And then you can go through your logs or historical records or whichever word suits you for that type of things. And you can figure out that at some point, a yellow door was installed and nothing has changed in between those two events. So you can calculate that the previous state of the door was yellow. So I mentioned the word events, many, many events and events and all you know, versions of it many, many times. So what is an event? An event is a notification that something has happened. Now, for the last decade or so, we've been abusing events for all kinds of different things, and I'll go a little deeper into that in a second. But for the purpose of this talk, and for the purpose of having a common understanding, I'd like you to think about events this way. An event 
is a notification that something has happened. Notice the past tense. That is the most valuable thing about events. They have happened. You cannot change them. They're immutable. Right? If something has happened, that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. It has happened. You can have a compensating action to uh, uh, reverse the state that was changed due to what was happened, but you cannot undo the thing. It has happened, period. So events are immutable, and that's the biggest power of the events. And now, when we start storing those changes, when we're storing those notifications about things that have happened, what we have, to quote Martin Fowler, is a, making a change a first-class thingamajig. So now you have a way to actually create an object in your system that represents a change, not, in, not a state, but a change. And that's a very, very powerful way to model software systems. So, since I said model, let's see how we can actually do that. One of the approaches to do modeling when you design software systems that work this way is event storming. Event storming is a business process discovery and design technique. If what it was uh, invented or brought to the world by uh, Alberto Brandolini uh, around 2013. And what it aims to do is to build shared understanding of the system. And shared is not between developers, but between the entire organizations. So if you're building a system that is for uh, in a specific domain, you can't build it with software developers only. You need the domain experts. But domain experts typically speak slightly, if not completely, different language than the developers. So what you need to do is to develop this shared understanding. So when they say, well, this will happen, everyone understands what they're talking about. And so this idea of event storming is, let's get everyone in the room and huge board where we can use sticky notes, and let's start modeling the events. What can happen in the systems? What changes will we observe during the life cycle of this system? And now when you have this, you say, this event can occur. Now you can start reasoning about that event and say, okay, why it occurs? Who causes it to occur? And who responds to that? If it happens, who, which part of the system or which system needs to be aware? So even before building software, you start thinking in events as your um, um, uh, basic uh, foundation around which everyone is organized. From a few years later, another technique emerged called event modeling. And event modeling, a lot of people actually argue that both event storming and event modeling are kind of the same. I'm not going to get into that debate, but the idea about event modeling is that is a, you can use events to do a, to, as a blueprint for a solution. And that idea was brought up by uh, Adam Dimitrik, uh, 2018. Um, and he thinks that we can get these events that can occur in a system and line them up roughly, like we, and then we know which event goes before or after which other event and we create this timeline. And then the summary of this is our source of truth. That's, around, that's the foundation around which we built the entire system. Uh, and so he, he's using, uh, um, uh, you can use different types of software to do that. Uh, and then you, can, you just had the central line, which is the events, and then you attach to that everything that's related to this. That could be event handlers, that could be forms that produce events, uh, and it is another, it's another design technique. Uh, interesting thing about that is that uh, Adam is running a lot of uh, uh, consulting and courses and stuff, and once they were doing an um, uh, exercise modeling a zoo, and you know, in the process of event discovery, they discovered you know, such an event. Now, I have no idea if that is a realistic event or not, 
but definitely not something it will, that will cross your mind if you design systems in a traditional way. Now, you know, just think about the power of that. The fact that you, 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 you event like this crosses your mind, it just gives you a whole bigger perspective of your entire system. You may disregard it next minute, right? Say, no, no, you know, we're not going to handle this, right? But just because the process is organized about events, you can, it opens your mind to, um, to think about systems differently. And so what is event-driven? OK, we spoke about events a lot, and we hear the word event-driven uh, a lot. So let me try to draw a little diagram here for you. So we have this thing event. It's a notification that something has happened, right? And then we have producers and consumers. So producers are those that notify that something has happened, and consumers are those interested that something has happened. Now, those are not particular software components. Don't think about it as Java classes or you know, deployables or jars or something. It's just conceptually, it's a role, right? A producer can also be a consumer, right? It's, it's the role that a component plays rather than the physical uh, representation of the component. And so a producer sends an event, and there, an event is essentially a message. So there is a, some sort of a message router which knows how to route those to consumers. And then consumers receive them, and they do something with them. And this is the time where a lot of you will say, yeah, 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 that's Kafka. And I'm uh, just not going to argue with that, uh, but um, it doesn't have to be Kafka. So. That's the general concept of event-driven. But event-driven is also a few other things. It's a buzzword. And I'm not, I don't mean it in the, in the bad sense. So it's a marketing term which is heavily used. And it's very, very uh, uh, mm, widely used when you promote your stuff, when you want to be noticed, uh, when you know, people search for things like this, so you want to be found. So, you know, like we do it, for example, with one of our products, Axon Framework. If you go on the README, it says it's an event-driven microservices system, blah, 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 right? You know, and it's totally fine. Uh, but just keep in mind that when you're using the term in this marketing sense, that, does not exp that, that is not a software technical uh, accurate term. It's there. Use it for uh, the word that... Uh, for, the, for the meaning of the word. Another thing that event-driven is, it's a false claim. And I'm explicitly pointing this out to warn you, because the word event-driven means that the events are the things that drive things, right? But when we go back to the notification of, uh, the, to the definition of an event, we said it's a notification for something that has happened, right? So, it is absurd to think that a notification is a driving factor. In fact, if the driving factor of every system are decisions. You make a decision to do this or not to do that, to apply or not to apply. That is, that is where the logic is. That is the driving factor. The notifications merely inform others that you've made such decisions. And this is the outcome of your decision. So we kind of do a shortcut and say, you know, it's event-driven. But in, in reality, keep in mind, that is the decisions that you make, the logic that you execute. Whether those decisions are made by humans or by machines, it doesn't matter. It's those decisions that actually are the driving factor, not, not the events themselves. Um, so yeah, the, the events are just the outcome of, the, of those decisions. Uh, another thing event-driven is, it's a polysemy. And polysemy essentially means it's a lexical ambiguity. And there is a, I'm not going to dive into this, but if you're interested, I highly recommend you to watch a talk by Martin Fowler, Circo 2017, uh, which is titled The Many Meanings of Event-Driven Architecture. And he goes, he dives deep into, uh, into that field and explains exactly what different people mean when they say event-driven. Um, so there's lots of different, under, uh, different understandings. Uh, and, and, and that causes a lot of confusion, because sometimes we 
Uh, we use the same word, we mean different things. And so I'm going to just briefly go through some of those things that Martin Fowler talks about. The first thing is an event notification. So event notification is one form of doing event-driven, uh, and it's uh, uh, giving a short notice via an event. You basically send a message that says something has happened. right? And as with any event-driven stuff, there is no response. So you just send events, and some people subscribe for events, and you send it, and uh, there is uh, typically the order is not that important. It's, if you think about it, it's kind of like LinkedIn sending you someone uh, with the job title recruiter review to your profile. Nice, LinkedIn. Who? When? Why? I don't know. If you want to know, what you need to do is you need to go to LinkedIn and, and dig into your history and stuff and eventually get some more information. So in terms of software diagram, this is more or less how it works. You get a notification that is a very, very short, short piece of, of, of notification. Basically says something happened. And if you want to know more, you have to go, you got to go back to the system from which the message originates and, asks for, and ask for the details. Now, that, with all the disadvantages of going back and forth and latencies and whatnot, has one significant advantage, which is the, the system that produces the message is the one that carries the data. So data is, is, is in one place. So, but you have to every time go and ask, right? Now, there is a different way to do things, and it's called event carried state transfer. So event carried state transfer is the opposite. It's basically passing down the, all the information that the consumer may need together with the message. So from the producer perspective, you think about things and say, well, th this is all you may need, so I pack that in an event and I send it to you. Now, the benefits of event carried state transfer is that you don't have to go back. You, supposedly, all the information that you need in order to process that event, it's already within the event. So that gives you, obviously, great resilience, reduced latency, and all the benefits. I think someone's trying to make a disco here. If you guys feel like dancing, be my guest. <laughs> um, OK, back to this. So, um, but when you do this, the price to pay for greater resilience and reduced latency is obviously consistency, right? So now you have this system which sends you a message, which carries the data, and what do you do with that data? You either immediately react using the data and then forget about it, or you have to store this data somewhere locally for you so you can access it later on. Both work fine, but the later brings the question of the source of truth. Who do you trust if you have a system like this? So, if you have multiple of those connections, producers and consumer, then for each of them, there is a source of truth, right? But it's multiplied on both sides. So let me show you this on the diagram. So obviously, with event notification, there's no such problem, because the source of truth is on the producer side, and that's it, period. That's the only place where the data leaves. But when you do event carried state transfer, now you have some source of truth on the producer side and some source of truth on the consumer side. And everything is great while those are in sync. The moment they are not, which one is correct one? how fast you can tell. Now that's where all the event-driven issues start building up. It's like, this system claims the user has purchased something, and this system claims it has not. How do you know which system claims the right thing? Right? So you have two sources of truth, and you, unless you do some fancy monitoring and, 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 and uh, tracing algorithms and stuff, it will be really hard to tell which system is actually uh, claiming the, the right thing. So let's pause here with this for a while and move on to the next approach, which is event streaming. Now, what is event streaming? So event streaming follows, builds up on those two concepts and says, since we are using this message router in the middle, 
What about we store all the events that pass by, all the messages, if you will, right? So we're going to create this message queue in our message router, and then every event, message, whatever that comes from somewhere, we'll store it there. When you do this, your consumers can track that queue or that list or that whatever implementation there is, uh, and then they can read messages, and they can read them at their own speed, whenever they want, uh, you know, they can adjust, they can reread. So that basically frees your consumers from the need to have a local copy of the data. Yeah, Kafka does that, but not only Kafka. Well, what about the source of truth in this case? So again, you can do this with event notification. It doesn't change anything because the source of truth is still one side. But when you do event carried state transfer, the storage on the consumer side essentially becomes a cache. You can store data locally for performance reasons, for, for data optimizations and whatnot, but that data is not crucial for you anymore. The moment you realize that data is quote unquote wrong or, or, in, or uh, incorrect or uh, not up to date, you can always throw that away, reread the message stream, and update your local data storage. So now, you shifted your source of truth from the edge of the consumers in the center. And is that, is that OK? It is. Some claim that's event sourcing, and that's how Kafka does event sourcing. Now, I'll dive a little deeper into that in a second. At the moment, I just want to tell you that's not really what event sourcing is, even though you'll see a lot of articles out there on the internet claiming that that is an event sourcing. What is an event sourcing? So, you ha we, this is where we are. We have our uh, message router. We have uh, our persistence within it with the, uh, with the message queue and stuff. Uh, but uh, what about the data storage? We still have two data storages. One is in the producer's side, and one is in the um, in the message, in the middle, in the, the message uh, router, in the message uh, uh, bus, whatever you want to call it, right? So there's still two sources of truth. So what if we want to get rid of the storage on the producer's side? And that's this crazy idea. If we already store everything that has happened within the system in that central place, why the producers need their own data? Can we get rid of this? And we can, the same way consumers do. We can make them read this stream of events and build their state from the past events. I know this sounds ridiculous if it is the first time you hear it, but think about it. Consider a producer being a Java class with JPA or whatever is your favorite persistence technique, right? What do you do? when you instantiate an object like this. You create an a, a, a object, and then you by hand or by using some framework, go to a database, read a record, and then translate the whatever data structure of the database is into fields, and then store it in that object. And from that point on, that object is, all, is useful for your application. It can do things, right? Well, you can do exactly the same thing with the event storage. You can, instead of going to the database, you go to the event store and say, give me all the past events and build my state. And then once I'm ready, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, with processing those, I can operate and do other stuff. Now, there is a few tricks about that. Uh, and that is the different components of different producers they don't have to read the entire event store. They don't have to read every single message because there's lots of messages that they didn't produce uh, that are irrelevant to them. So what they need to do is they need to be able to say, just give me all the events that I have produced in the past, and then build their state based only on those events. And if you have this, then you have a single source of truth. 
your message router, your event store within the message router becomes your single source of truth. Everything that has ever happened in your system is in one place. Yeah, I know the question after the session will be about a single point of failure. We've, you know, it's the same thing like with databases. You can scale it, you can distribute it, there's, there's techniques to do that. But conceptually, now you never ever have to worry again who is right, because it's always in, in, in one place. That's what we call event store. So we have this thing, event store, that stores all these events, right? And, um, uh, and, and uh, Kafka does not have this, naturally. You can do it with Kafka and, and databases, and there's a bunch of techniques to do this with Kafka if you really want to. The problem with that is all those traditional storage solutions, like databases, NoSQLs, and whatnot, they, their performance degrades with time. Like if you do it to a you know, couple of million events, that's probably totally fine. If you go with billions and zillions, of, you know, trillions of events, uh, that's, that's not going to work. So what, how is an event store different? What an event store needs to, um, uh, uh, needs to be able to do uh, to, to overcome this? First of all, an event store needs to be an append only. We said events are immutable. We're never going to change an event that has occurred in the past. We're never going to delete an event. And we're never going to insert an event between two other events. So we don't have to implement those. The only thing that could ever happen in terms of changes to, the, to an event store is append an event at the end. Now, that may seem like um, uh, irrelevant, but that is what actually gives you uh, the ability to do tons of performance optimizations versus databases and, and, and NoSQL solutions and, and everything else. Because of the generic nature of databases, they have to support these operations. Otherwise, they're useless, right? So they're very good at providing you inserts and deletes and updates and stuff like that. And that comes as a pr at, at price. That's why their performance degrades over time. With Event Store, you by definition don't have to deal with this. So you can, you can have a linear performance no matter how many events are there. The second thing that an Event Store needs to do is a full sequential read. You, can say, you, you, you should be able to say, give me all the events that you have stored from zero to whatever is the latest event today. And now that's relatively easy when you think about event store, but when you start thinking about storing this in traditional databases or even uh, document-based databases, like how do you actually do that? Are all the events going to be in one table? Are you going to do table joins? Is it going to be a single document, multiple documents? Again, traditional solutions are designed to serve different purposes. So uh, querying time and, and, and interaction time always degrades with time. As uh, event store is designed to do exactly that. So full sequential read is a fundamental characteristics of an event store. Um, then it needs to do replace. And replace is essentially the same thing, like read the whole stream, but only for the things that I'm interested in. So I'm an event handler, and I'm interested in events of type X. So at any point in time, I should be able to go and tell the event store, give me all the events of type X, because that's the only thing I'm interested in. Right? And it should be able to give me those in a, in a very uh, efficient way. Um, then uh, what up on the producer side, and I'm just using a DDD term here, aggregate, but Think a bit of a, as a pro, any producer, uh, right? On the producer side, you have a different, fun, you need a different functionality. You need to be able to tell, give me all the events that I have produced in the past. I don't really care who consumed them and what they did with them, but I need to rebuild my state. And in order to rebuild my state, I only need the events that I have myself sent in the past. Um, now. No matter how efficient an event store is, as you only append events and you have like millions and billions, trillions, whatever events, it's gonna, it's gonna be painful. Not on the event store, but on your side. Like you can read 
like trillions of events, uh, but then your code needs to go through those and rebuild state, right? And with time, that's going to come with lots of performance penalties. So an essential feature of an every event store is snapshotting. So snapshotting is a way for you to tell the event store, at certain condition, make a snapshot of your current state, right? And remember that. And next time I ask you to give me my events, you're going to give me the latest snapshot and all the events after that. And so from your, build, your, your application uh, perspective, then you don't have to read, I don't know, millions, billions of events. You only get a snapshot and then apply a bunch of events on top of that. <laughs> right? So that's a, that may sound like a, a nice to have optimization, but in real life scenario, that's actually a fundamental crucial feature if you want to be uh, performant. And one of the last things I just want to mention here is partitioning and archiving. And that's typically hard to explain, so I'm going to just give you an example. I don't know how many of you work for any companies that build financial software or accounting and stuff like that, but those of you that are maybe familiar that in accounting, you have the notion of closing years. And some other uh, e industries, they close months or close weeks, right? And so the idea is, once the financial year is closed, all the documents from the past years are irre irrelevant. On your day-to-day -day work, you're operating on the invoices and documents that are from this year or from this month, right? That's what is important for you that may be uh, uh, affecting your business. The events from the past two, three, five, ten years are not, do no longer that relevant, but you don't want to delete them. There's always a chance that something's going to happen. Someone's going to come and say, hey, let's in, um, uh, you know, inspect what invoices we had five years ago. So you don't want to lose that data, right? but you don't want it to mess around with it every time you do something. So if your event store has the ability uh, to partition and archive parts of things, that's a very huge optimization, because you only keep in memory the latest data that your system works with. And everything else can be offloaded to slower machines, to you know, archives, and whatever your business logics allow to do. So that's the fundamental characteristics of, a, of, a, of an event store. So you have now the message router, you have an event store, the producers, the consumers, the messages. And then now we can claim we are event driven. Uh, and this is uh, oh, actually not even a lot of people go that far, but if you go that far, it's almost like it almost feels natural to say we are now event driven. That's almost true for with two exceptions. And those are what I call passive aggressive events. And now let me give you an example of that because it's hard to explain otherwise. Consider this event. Joe ordered to paint door 28 in red. What this event tells you? Will. Will it? May happen. Yeah. Joe may find someone who will say, may say, OK, I will paint. This, is this carrying any information about things that has happened? Yeah, Joe ordered. That's the only information here, right? Uh, gave the money is an assumption, right? Um, so essentially what you see here, it's not an event. It's a command. It's an order. You're asking someone or something to do something, right? But because we are so event-driven and because everything needs to be events, right, we start masquerading those as events and start to pretend that uh, you know, there's no other way to model things, so let's you know, just send an event, uh, right? The difference between this and a regular event is that you don't know what's going to happen, and most likely you would at least need a confirmation that someone has received that message and will proceed, or no one has received it and nothing's going to happen, right? So there's a different communication style here versus the communication style that we have with events. Now consider this. Joe asked, what's the color of door 28? Is that an event? Well, it is not. It is a query. It's a request for information, right? 
The fact that Joe asked, it's probably irrelevant in your system. Well, it may be for logging or auditing purposes, but the fact that the most important in that event is the response, right? You need to be able to get the information back. So it's not a notification. You don't send it and forget it. You're actually actively waiting for a response that carries data. So think about how you do this with something like a regular, like Kafka, for example. Um, what you're going to do, you're going to have a topic where you send queries, and then you're going to listen on another topic where some other events will come back, and then you're going to have correlation IDs to actually link, right? OK, let me make it a little bit more complicated for you. Joe asked, what's the color of all doors? Right? Now, think of the logic of like, how all these things flow between distributed systems and, and whatnot. And all that because we refuse to think about me messages being of different types and having different delivery strategies and, and, and expectations, right? But because we have a message router, and I explicitly called it a message router earlier and not an event router, we can actually model communication for messages and not only events, right? And so what if we make our message router to also route commands? Now, commands have different uh, uh, specifics, uh, d d different expectations. They're not sent to everyone. They're sent to a component that can handle a specific command, typically. So you may also be able to, um, in a distributed environment, find that component on different deployment uh, units and whatnot. But at the end of the day, it's typically one component that receives the command and does something and it's going to respond somehow, at least saying, I will or will not do it, right? Because there may be an error or something. So the routing pattern is find me a component that can do this, right, and send it to that component, which requires the message router to have a minimum information about routing uh, commands, right? And same things with Curious. If you send a request for information, um, then you may route it to one or multiple components, right? You can get the response from one component, or you can get the response from multiple components and join the response, merge it together, and send one response back. There's lots of patterns to, to, to do different things here. But it doesn't change the fact that in this message routing process, the most important part is sending back the response, because that's what the original uh, initiator of the communication expects. They expect a response. That does not mean the, the communication has to be synchronous. It can be asynchronous. It can be you know, through a variety of different infrastructures. But it doesn't change the fact that the response is the key, not the question. So we have three types of messages here. And Two of those are called commands and queries, and if you're familiar or we have ever heard of CQRS, this is the time where you can say, oh, yeah, you're talking about CQRS. Well, yes, I am, and uh, let me briefly tell you what CQRS is. CQRS is a command query responsibility separation. So you try to separate the commands from the queries uh, so you can optimize independently. Uh, it's distinct models. Now, in the early days when Greg Young announced that, and I, I think it was circa 2010, um, he, he basically said, have one class with actions, commands, and have one class with queries, right? Things have evolved since then. We're not talking about classes or objects anymore. We're talking about models. So you build an object model of something. Right, of your domain, whatever that is. That's a banking system, uh, I don't know, telco system, financial, whatever. Right? And you model it. Right? That's how we design software. We try to create a model of the real thing. Right? And for many, many years, what we've tried to do is try to find that one model, that, that one perfect model that fits all, all use cases that we have. Right? And so do we, have, do we need that field? We don't need it for changes, but when someone may ask, OK, let's snap it in. Uh, right? Do we need that field? No. Three months down the road, someone needs it. 
right? So the idea of building one model that fits all use cases, it's, it's not something that works very well in all cases. For fairly simple systems, it works. But in, the more complex the system is, the more obvious it becomes that you can't do this. But when you separate the uh, change-making side from purely information uh, delivering side, now you can have multiple models. You can have a model of your software that is only responsible for changes, and that only contains the information that you would need in order to make a change in the system. Right? And then on the query side, when you need to return information to people who ask for it, you may have multiple models because those are read-only. They only serve information. So you can have a model that is persisted as, uh, in a database or in a NoSQL or a, as a file or in an LDAP or in whatever is that is the performance. And they can all have different fields, different relationships. Right? You design the model according to who's going to be asking for information and who's going to be um, um, reading that information and in what form and what's more efficient and the, the, le the least uh, transformation that you need to do uh, and things like that. So the events then are the bridge between your command model and your query model. So on the command side, whenever you do operations that change things, you would perform an operation and send an event and say, we did this. There's a notification that a change has occurred. Now, your query side will receive that event and will say, oh, this has happened. Let me update my model in a database, in a you know, NoSQL, in LDAP, in wherever, right? And so if you want to implement SecureS yourself, that could be a very challenging, um, uh, very challenging um, task. But if you already are in this place here, so we already know how to route events, we already know how to route queries, and we already know how to route uh, commands. So essentially, we have all the bits and pieces in place. So if you are uh, with this approach, you already have the groundwork laid out for doing SecureS. And that is what we at Exonic uh, figure out over the years that if you build systems this way, all these otherwise hard-to-implement techniques in software engineering, like domain-driven design, like event sourcing, like SecureS, become trivial. Well, trivial is probably an overstatement. There's still quite a lot of work to do uh, for you as a uh, one building the systems. There's quite a lot of domain knowledge you have to gain. There's quite a lot of thinking you need to do about how to model things. So there's nothing trivial about it. But at least you don't have to worry about implementation details. You can focus on your business cases. What are your business events that make sense in that, uh, in that space? Right? How do things should communicate with each other? And you don't have to worry about things like these tiny arrows on, that we so happily draw on every slide or whiteboard. Um, that's why we came up with this product called Axon Server. And Axon, Axonic Cloud is a um, software as a service version on the cloud uh, as, of Axon Server. So what Axon Server is, is an event store, uh, one of the very few out there. Uh, and an event router, much like Kafka, right? It's both things. So it, it knows how to, it, it recognizes the street message patterns, it recognizes command queries and events, and it's also a very efficient event store. So commands and queries, they go, they pass, they're gone, right? But all the events are stored in the event store, and then you can do event sourcing, and you can do all kinds of things, you can go back in history, um, and, and a lot of other things. Now, all these arrows, as I mentioned, we so happily draw on diagrams like this, they don't automatically work. Surprise, surprise. When you start coding, you know, the amount of work that you need to do in order for this component to talk to that component via that tiny arrow, it's actually a significant uh, investment. So that's the other product that we have. It's called Axon Framework, and it helps you exactly with these things. It has three things. It has an event bus. 
um, command bus and query bus, which you can use to send those three types of, uh, of messages. And it has Java annotations so that other site consumers can register themselves. And you can just use an annotation and say, hey, I'm a consumer of events, and I can handle these types of events. Or I'm a consumer of commands, I can do these things. Right? And then the framework, and also the server, depends on which one you use, is smart enough just enough, it, do, it does not inspect your messages, it does not really care what the payload is, but it knows the type, and it knows how to route the message to the right place, and if a response is needed, it knows how to route the response back. So those are the, two, the, 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 the three main products that we have, and I'm just going to um, show you uh, the, the short description of everything I said so far. Uh, Axon Framework is fully open source, like in a traditional OSI uh, open source uh, sense. Um, Axon Server is not o uh, certified open source. It doesn't use an uh, open source license. It's our own license, but it's completely free to use. The only limitation is you cannot fork it and make your own version of it. Uh, but other than that, you can use it absolutely for free. Uh, there is an enterprise version with a lot of other features, uh, which is paid uh, if you want to. And Axonic Cloud, there is a free tire to up to a certain amount of messages. So if you don't want to install, although it's a tiny little thing, uh, but if you don't want to mess up with your machine, uh, you can just, do, uh, just use it uh, in the cloud. And in case anything of what I said today is uh, 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 new, of interest to you, a few more links. We have this thing called Exonic Academy, uh, where we do courses about these topics, like event-driven, um, uh, secure S event sourcing, uh, and, and domain-driven design, and, all, and whatnot. The conceptual courses are free. Uh, then if you want to dive into, uh, into more complex stuff, um, and there are more courses. Uh, Discuss platform is where you can get in touch with us, and uh, not only for the products, but if you have ideas like, hey, I want to model this system, and I have no idea how should I model it, our folks and our community is there to, uh, to provide help. Initializer is essentially, if you, I assume most of you are Spring fans, so you probably know the Spring Start thing where you pick your dependencies and it builds your application, uh, your project. Uh, yeah, that's the same thing for us. And my colleague Sara Tori is uh, actually uh, uh, working on a podcast which she, she releases every week or two, talking to some of those names that I mentioned earlier, but also colleagues. Um, so if you are into a podcast thing, uh, it would be uh, also something interesting to follow. So that's pretty much what I had for you today. I um, hope it was interesting. Uh, and I think we thank you again for joining me so early this morning. Um, I think we're going to open it for a question. I think we still have two minutes.